hello everybody and welcome to another Tech and Talk. Um, today we have Sarah Wells from the Financial Times, um, one of my favorite newspapers, and she's been leading up uh, the efforts at Financial Times um, around getting their new practices, shall we say, um, and getting DevOps and Agile and all of the goodness of that um, incorporated into um, FT.com and the operations side of that. So I'm going to let um, Sarah introduce herself and talk a little bit, and then we're going to have a little Q&A conversation at the end of that. And um, with that, I'll let Sarah get started introducing herself. Hi there. Um, so I've been working at the Financial Times for six years. Um, up until fairly recently, I was the tech lead for our content platform. So I've been very inv uh, involved in the transformations that we've done over that time. We have made a lot of changes. I've recently moved into a new role as technical director for operations and reliability. So I'm going, uh, that's going to be a role where I expand on some of this. Um, but I just wanted to share some slides that I put together um, to present to our business uh, to try and explain why we made the kinds of transformations that we've made over the last few years. And I think it's easy as technical people to get quite focused on on, on the reasons we're doing it from a technical point of view, but actually it's good to think and stop and sell it to the business as well. So these were slides for a non-technical audience, but I'll expand as I go. So the transformation I'm talking about is really around the move to DevOps, the adoption of the cloud uh, using containers, a move to use all the things from cloud native. Um, so doing that kind of transformation costs time and money, so you have to be able to explain. So when I joined the FT, in 2011, all our software ran on machines in our own data centers. We had developers and we had operations, and there was very much a throw over the wall approach to releasing stuff. And we had very limited automation. So um, setting up a new server was all done by hand. And if you wanted to build a new product, you had to buy that server and configure it. And it, on average, it took about four months to do it. And if you're going to take four months to set up a server, you have to be pretty confident in your idea because you're placing a pretty sizable bet that it's worth this investment. And when we did have that server, we weren't able to release new software onto it without system downtime. Uh, for the old FT website, uh, it was a, the website that was running up until 2016, uh, we had to do releases outside of normal working hours because nothing could be published while the release was happening. And the application was a monolith. Uh, it sat on a relational database. So schema changes were the, the real killer on that. So um, what that meant is that releases obviously happened rarely because we did uh, once a month on a Saturday. And you can't try something out unless you have lots of opportunities to do that. So when you only have 12 releases a year, you obviously can't experiment. And when you do a release, uh, because you're doing it so rarely, it, every release is terrifying, which meant that we put a lot of process around those releases. So to make sure we try, try and make sure we didn't break anything. And this is genuinely a real diagram of the process we went through to release stuff. And a lot of the steps in this are around validating that we can recover if things go wrong. So now um, there's been a complete transformation. Uh, of the organization over the space of maybe two or three years. So first of all, we can provision a server in minutes. And I worked out, I think it's one, it's eight hundredths of a percent of the time to get a server set up. And that's a huge difference because it means you can try something out today. You don't have to wait for someone to buy something and configure it. And in terms of releases, we do a lot more. So uh, I was in charge until recently of the content publishing delivery platform at the FT, and we did around 2,200 releases last year. And just for fun, I created the same a graph with the same scale for our releases in 2014. And as you can see, it, it's barely visible. And if you add in the FT.com website, which now we, we have two separate things, the platform and the website, we used to have one thing. It's roughly 500 times as many releases as we used to do for the same functionality. And that means you can experiment because you're releasing things maybe 20 times a day and you can try out individual made this happen? Well, obviously automation. It's kind of the first thing that anyone does when they start thinking about DevOps or they start thinking about improving stuff. And obviously the computers are better at doing this, but everything is automated. You you basically don't have to, to do it manually. You're less likely to make mistakes. 
And from a technical point of view, there have been several iterations in this process at the FT. So the first thing we did was um, running in our own data centers using Puppet. And we deployed one service per VM, and we had things like monitoring and log aggregation as part of that. So that was a massive improvement on what we had before. Um, but actually, one service per VM is uh, quite wasteful in terms of optimization. Uh, you tend to not be very cost effective on that. Um, and you don't really want to be running your own data center. So the next iteration involved us moving on to AWS. We're pretty in on AWS here. Um, it's a lot cheaper and lots of things become someone else's problem. And then after that, the next thing that we did was look at containerization. But the FT is actually quite diverse in terms of our approaches. We, we have a sense we want teams to be empowered to choose their own solution. So in fact, we have some teams that are uh, still using Puppet and running on stuff in on AWS one service per VM. We have several teams that are running Kubernetes, so basically running containers, and we have quite a few teams using Heroku, where you're basically passing even more stuff off to be someone else's problem. So obviously, cat and not pets. Um, we used to definitely have pets. We had servers in the FT that had a riverside view in the center of London, and uh, they were all different, and that's not the case anymore. We can basically trust that most of our VMs will, will get on there. We understand what's, what's there, what's installed. The next thing we did, if it hurts, do it more often. Jez Humble is right. This comes from the Continuous Delivery book. Um, it is counterintuitive, but uh, you do benefit from doing the painful stuff more often because you have to solve the reasons why it's painful. Once we decided that we wanted to be able to release code at any time, we had to architect our systems so that we could release that code without affecting people currently using the system. And because we do lots and lots of releases, obviously we know what changes in each of these. You can understand the change and you can uh, measure the difference. And also if something goes wrong, it's much easier to work out what it actually is. We used to do those monthly releases. If something went wrong, you had to work out which of probably hundreds of changes actually had had the impact. Um, now we don't have to do that. Obviously, when you do something all the time, uh, they get easier. So we just it's just useful. We can, we can release and we can look at the process and say, here's a small tweak we can make. And then the, feed, the thing that's really important here, and I think Anne Curry in one of your earlier podcasts mentioned this, is the feedback loops, the ability to do things faster is, is the crucial thing. And there's research that suggests that only 20% of features in a custom software product get used, and the other 80% is just a waste of time and money. But you don't know which is the 80% upfront. So you actually need to get that out there in front of people to, to tell that. And we can do that because we release things many times a day, and we basically get them out there as soon as they're available. Um, we don't go off into a rabbit hole where we're building something we think people will like, but they don't. Um, and an example of this would be something like, um, we have film reviews on the FT, and we thought, well, what if we put the score, like the star rating on the index page? That'll be nice. We can, with the list of reviews, that'll be a nice thing to do. But it turns out that if you do that, people don't necessarily go and read the film review, and that's what we want them to do. But we were able to measure that really quickly. And the, but there's a bonus about doing the releases, uh, more from which is, the failure rate. When we did 12 a year, one or two of them would fail um, pretty much every every year. It's about a 15% failure rate. Um, but now it's probably less than 1%. And when it does fail, it's so much quicker for us to solve that problem. So I said that I mentioned DevOps. I think you build it, you run it is, is a kind of um, central thing about doing DevOps. When you have separate teams doing development operations, they have conflicting goals because developers want to get things out there and operations want to keep things stable. And clearly the most stable system is one that never changes. But we don't have those two separate teams anymore. And the people that really choose to do the releases are the same people that, that built the code. They can decide what the risk is of making a change. So, and it turns out that developers do understand the risk. You, there aren't many code releases that happen at five o'clock on a Friday. And when they are, it's because people understand that that's not going to cause the problem. So basically, lots of this is around DevOps, which is basically a cultural change. It's not a process change. It's about deciding that you can trust your people and get them to collaborate. Um, but it's also about cloud native. And I took this list from Anne's podcast, where the um, first three 
uh, for what the Cloud Native Computing Foundation defines as cloud native, and the other two are the ones Anne identifies as important. And I think that we actually are absolutely doing the last three of these. It's standard. We, we build things as microservices, everything's automated, it's all in the cloud. The first two, we either do that or we hand it all off to someone else. So when we're using Heroku, we're, we're letting them do the management and the package, and those things work for us. So that's really a quick summary of some of the changes we've done and just a few stats to show uh, the impact, really. It's, it's really, it's, it's great to hear it at, from, a, um, from a, a media perspective too, because we expect so much from our media websites and uh, the folks that are serving up the news and uh, even the little, anti, uh, uh, and it, the little, um, story about the taking off the star rating so that people actually read it. Um, we, we as end user consumers expect um, so much variation and so much content um, um, accessible that um, it, we forget that the underpinnings of that um, is, are technically um, difficult to achieve sometimes. And so it, mm. it's, it's interesting to hear it from, from your perspective because we often hear, um, at least that I do in my Red Hat role, from large enterprises that are, you know, manufacturers or financial services, or that, and um, they have um, other issues that they have to to deal with, like security and privacy and 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 things that are, are really high up. But the experimentation bit that comes um, and the ability when you're doing so many different releases is just um, phenomenal and, and a huge game changer for most of the industry as well. Um, you you mentioned yeah, so so our um, sorry no, our, our website team when when they started to build uh, the new version of um, ft.com a few years ago they absolutely built in from the very beginning the ability to do a b testing of things so everything that we build has a hypothesis and a measurement so we can say whether we achieve what we were trying to do or not and yeah. it's incredibly powerful because it's amazing how often your hypothesis is actually wrong it's it's curious in terms of the effect it's, it's to me too is like what I really like is is the mix. You guys probably are um, the epitome of a hybrid operation. You know, still doing some stuff with VM, still doing stuff on AWS with Puppet, still doing some stuff with Kubernetes, and you know this whole mix. And you are sort of the poster child for hybrid cloud deployments um, in, in the way that you you talk and describe your your situation. I'm wondering if you've had to grow your operations team, if the size of the team has changed or the, the you know, how big the team is behind um, FT. So I think over the last few years, we probably have a slightly smaller operations team than we had before, but that's because we expect a lot of things to be picked up by delivery teams. Partly because it, the freedom to choose lots of different technologies means that it's very hard for a cent central team to understand all of the things. And partly because our new architectures are actually pretty reliable. They're built, they're built to be resilient. So we, we kind of expect the things that actually happen to be things where we might have to get people in with specialist knowledge. Um, and the, the fact that we have so much variety, I mean, it's great and it's let people move really quickly. Uh, in my new role, one of the things I need to look at is how that impacts on an operation team and to try and find some things that we can do that, are, that we make common across the FT. Because one of the downsides of everyone being empowered to do their own thing is everyone solves the same problem a subtly different way. Yeah. We, we've run into this. Like I remember the promise early days of um, platform as a service was that you know, developers could use whatever bespoke uh, framework that they wanted to use or language or database. Or that. And so there was this, you know, a little bit of an underlying thing, theme of, you know, people could go off and build a container with anything in it. Have you done anything along the lines of like standardizing the frameworks that you're using or the tools that you're, you're using at, at all? Or you, is, I can't imagine that it's a complete free for all. It's, um, there's a fairly lightweight standardization. Um, we probably feel we could do a little bit more, but for example, pretty much everyone sends logs to, to our log aggregation setup mm -hmm. because it's useful to be able to look at things across all of 
all of our applications. We have a, a standard for a health check on applications, so we expect that on a particular, you know, underscore underscore health, you will return JSON of a particular format so that we can easily plug that into monitoring. So we've had really quite a lot of success with things that say you need to do this, but we don't really mind how you do it. Um, and then we find that some things are just, you know, people start using them and it spreads around the organization because it's so obviously a useful tool. And I think that's where we want to go. We want to be trying to say, show people things and say, um, here is something that we think you'd find useful. And the proof is whether they then adopt it. The, the, and another thing that the interesting thing for me that in your slides, you were talking about um, that it was as recently as 2016 that you were on the old FT.com site. And um, that's only two two years ago. Uh, that's a that's a very rapid amount of change in un, um, under two years, really. What what sort of um, impact has that had on, on the team and the culture? moving that quickly so yeah so i guess that went live the new website went live two years ago probably probably um had been under development for about a year so so there'd been some overlap but yeah there has been it I, i'd say there's been a fairly big transformation for most people it's so obviously much nicer to all the, a lot of your frustrations went away you know it's so frustrating to say oh, i have to go to I have to go to a meeting um, on a Tuesday to decide that I can release on the Saturday or something like that. That, that that's a frustrating thing for a developer. So um, mostly people re welcome the fact that they are trusted. They're trusted to make the right decision. And a lot of it, the crucial thing is having the right sort of people. So it's having people that are interested in trying trying new things and are quite flexible and willing to 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 just learn something new has been really important. Yeah. No, I think I think that's, um, it's for me, it's been a lot of um, cultural shift within organizations like like FT and others. Um, and you're, you're spot on with the description of, you know, people who are flexible and able to take on new technologies and changes. And, 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 and frankly, the stuff isn't that, it, it's a bit of a mind bend, but it's not that much different than the coding we did before and it almost gets us back to being more of coders um, and, and gives us a lot more freedom, I think, than I, for me, um, the one thing that really got me out of being a, a full-time coder was because I had to um, take four months before I could see my stuff released. And now, um, you know, with a containerized universe and cloud native universe, I can get stuff up and running in in minutes, um, as you described as well, and and that just is um, almost a joyful thing, you know, to be able to see the fruits of your labor out there in in the real world um, and get the feedback, you know, it's, it's like instant gratification, um, in some ways, and it really changes, I think, in what I've seen, the demeanor of people who are developers, um, with the willingness of them to work in large organizations as large organizations shift as opposed to all focusing in on um, wanting to work on little in startups and shortage or wherever. Um, <laughs> it's e I think it makes it easier for big enterprises to recruit um, fresh and flexible and new um, new technology people um, as opposed to if you were going to sit them into and I'm trying not to disparage any old systems, but like a large enterprise ERP or publishing system or a monolith and ask them to work on that for the rest of their natural lives. It's it's a new world and I think it makes it much more interesting for people who are developers. I, I, I agree completely. We've had definite ability to recruit people who would otherwise be working in banks, yeah. you know, for more money because we can say, well, you won't have that frustration. It, it's really interesting to me that the FT, we started uh, our hack days probably in 2011. And the difference between the first hack day and the latest hack day, you know, the original hack days, you, you'd build something, you'd be running it locally, you'd be mocking things up. The last hack day, people actually put some stuff live behind feature flags on our website. Yep. You know, they've got, they've yep. set up DNS entries, they've created a run book, they've done, they've just done everything and um, they've done it in hours, whereas you used to be really desperately trying to get things to work. So things like Heroku, things like having your platform set up is really good. 
Yeah. But I did want to say one yeah. thing about the idea of you get to go back to being a coder, because one thing I've really seen with this is we are less coders than we are all sorts of things, because yeah. the amount of time that people on my team spend or that I spend coding versus um, making a choice about technology, setting up infrastructure, doing oper operational type things, it's changed. It's definitely the code's the simple bit now. It's all it's a microservice architecture. It's all the stuff in between that is really complicated. Ah, see, I, I, I'm seeing some, uh, like maybe a different aspect too, is, is that um, things that I couldn't do before um, because I didn't have the compute resources and, and I'm thinking of things like machine learning and predictive analysis and things that, um, that you know, the compute resources were difficult to acquire um, or yeah. uh, in terms of, you talked about the four months to getting something, to seeing something in production. Um, so. I, I kind of see new workloads being available for me to um, code on and stuff. But you're, you're right about the off side of things. Um, it does uh, make us more beholden and responsible for where our code runs and, and what we do. Um, and there is no more throwing it over the wall um, in, anymore. You, you really do have to, um, if you build it, you have to run it as well. So it's, yeah. it's an interesting new world. You, yeah, you are absolutely right. The, the ability to just say, hey, there's a new library and I can try it out and I can have something live is it's so powerful. What we find then is that the I now need to make this I now need to make this something that's scalable and secure and the, all of that stuff becomes a much bigger part of your effort. The actual putting it together is, is become simpler. Definitely. So, so in your new role, what, what's your biggest challenge? Um, as you roll this out further into FT? So, um, so it's not so much that I'm rolling this out because actually it's been done all over the FT. Uh, my challenge here is partly to try and bring us back to be doing, uh, having a little bit more common stuff between us. I think we've gone too far in terms of the diversity of approach, it makes it difficult for um, a sort of first line operations to support things. Um, so the, the challenge is to, is to build a tooling that helps us to support our applications and to convince delivery teams that they want to use it. So it's build things that people actually actively want to use. Yeah, yeah. We, we see that with um, things and like we have a, a, a set of tooling called Source to Image, which helps us build images that are shareable and are reproducible and manageable um, uh, for you know, the, the different stacks that people are using. And we see that in um, lots of different aspects of it too. It, it, it's that, I mean, it's, it goes back to what I was saying earlier about the promise of pause was I could use anything I wanted, but the reality is that you know, some sort of standardization on the images and the image catalogs that we use and reuse so that we're not building, you know, um, new images every time we push out a new app or something that we can use layered image approaches and things of that nature. I also think the, the work that the service broker folks are doing in Kubernetes in terms of um, allowing you to create service catalogs um, that you can share microservices amongst different applications and, and incorporate them is going to make a big difference um, for people like yourselves. Mm. Yeah, we've, we've definitely found a kind of wider scale within the organization that a move to a microservice architecture and the fact that people can build tools to and applications to help in very short amounts of time means we've got so many things um, and knowing who owns them, you know, how to fix them, where they're running, it, it, it's a challenge. So we, we're looking very carefully at, you know, we have a we have a central database for our systems. We're, we're looking at how we make that into a really high quality thing that we can use in a lot of ways. Yeah. So take take a look if you get a chance um, at some of the stuff that's going on in the Open Service Broker Initiative inside mm. of Kubernetes. I think you'll find that is really helpful, the creating service catalogs to use across um, your the entire enterprise. That's that so they have more shared resources and, a, and an easier way of cataloging them and maintaining them. Mm. That's really been very helpful for a lot of other folks as well. Um, it sounds really interesting. Yeah, so um, I, I know you, you mentioned that you're using Heroku um, and I don't think Heroku is on Kubernetes yet. I, um, 
it, how are you finding um, running Kubernetes in house um, and managing that? Is that been um, a big learning curve for you guys, or is that just something that now is part and parcel of your infrastructure team? It's been a learning curve. It's been it's been implemented by two separate delivery teams. Um, I'd say the challenge for one of the teams, this was their first containerized stack. Um, the yeah. other team, it was probably my team, was a bit more challenging because actually uh, two years ago we built our own stack and moving 150 microservices across, uh, it just takes it just takes time. If you basically like, okay, so we need to have a Helm chart for each of them, we need to set the pod. Um, affinity, we need to set memory limits, you know, we, there's a whole bunch of work. Um, so I think having built it yourself, you're just, you look at, at, at um, Kubernetes and you go, great, this will be much better than what we built. But then you have to get there. Yeah, you have to get there. The DIY Kubernetes deployments is, is always interesting um, to hear what, what shape, how they shape up and, and, and how much work and effort it takes to, to get them out and deploy. And it, what'll be interesting is to see maybe a year from now, where you're at um, in terms of the standardization and if you take what, what approach you, you've, you've managed to take with the, with having so many, we have VMs, you have Kubernetes and you're using Heroku, um, how you manage to um, implement that um, approach to standardization. So I'd be curious yeah. to hear more on that. In, in it the, is definitely going to be interesting. Yeah, I, I think it is. It's a challenge. It's um, one of the things that that we, because um, I work on the OpenShift project, because um, we have we we have the ability to run OpenShift on on any cloud, on AWS or anywhere, um, and G, and GCP or on bare metal. So it's the same interface, it's the same service catalog, it's you know across all of those platforms. So that makes it easier because um, you're all sharing the same um, images and, and tooling. So it'll be interesting to see how you mix and match um, and, and how you grow that. Um, so I'm sure there's lots more to talk about in, around that. And, and uh, I think the other thing that I like to do on these tech and talks, and, and I'll ask you too as well, is if, there's, um, if there was one other person in the industry that you would like coaching from or to hear from, who would that be? So, um... So someone who I think is saying a lot of interesting stuff in the areas that I'm really interested in, which is around microservices, observability, is um, Cindy Stridhan. She's written a couple of really interesting blog posts about how testing changes in a distributed um, microservice-based architecture on um, observability and um, cloud native. Um, I think that she's really interesting. That would be a that's a great suggestion. I, I've read some of that stuff, so I, I, I'll have to reach out and see if I can coerce her into coming on um, as a guest to talk about this. And and um, I wish you all the best in in your new role. And um, I look forward to hopefully meeting you sometime soon in person as we get over to London for the um, upcoming OpenShift Commons gathering um, on the 31st of January. Um, and if you're listening to this um, in the next few weeks and you'd like to join us at the, at the OpenShift Commons gathering, um, drop me a line and I will get you um, hooked up with an invite. So um, again, Sarah, thank you very much for taking the time out. I know your day is really busy and um, we really appreciate um, hearing your perspectives on all things cloud native. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's been fun.